2022, we were supposed to come out with our Gamma Master nozzles. Handwriting is atrocious, it's gonna be hard. But that ended up slipping all the way to 2023. And you can see, based on what I was talking about a little bit earlier around timelines, product development timelines, sometimes things just take forever to figure out how to do correctly. And so Gamma Master ended up being a 2023 release. And so was our Mosquito Prime hot end. And Mosquito Prime actually started back here with Magnum Plus. Magnum Plus and Prime were started at the same time, but just the level of difficulty of actually developing the product and releasing it in a way that met our expectations and was able to make a significant impact on the market took us years. Hey everyone, I'm Dan Barus, the CEO and co-founder of Slice Engineering. I started Slice along with my co-founder Chris in his garage in 2017. Since then, we've developed some of the world's only FDA cleared print heads and mil spec certified print heads for use by our expeditionary forces. And we also make upgrades that you can buy on Amazon for your Ender 3. So anything in that range. We decided to do this AMA series because I get a lot of the same questions over and over again, either through comments or email or at trade shows. Hopefully you can join us for this journey and get some of your burning questions answered. So today we're going to be talking about product development and why it takes so dang long to produce a product. If you've never done product development, it might seem ridiculous that it takes you know, one, two, three years to bring a product to market. That may seem crazy. And if you have a product development background, one, two, three years sounds pretty normal or maybe even like a short timeline. You know, if you're building a car, for example, that product development timeline might be a decade from initial concept drawings to when the first units roll off the product floor or the production floor, factory floor. And if you're developing a consumer product, sometimes that stuff gets turned around really quickly but usually there's a pretty long development cycle. And so we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. I love Steve Jobs and kind of the ethos that he built at Apple. Uh, obviously I'm not alone in that. There's a lot of people that are, that are fans of the way they do product development. And one of the things that he's pretty famous for is that originally he narrowed down the amount of products that they were trying to produce in a given year to one to two products. And that was it. And this is when they were a, a multi-billion dollar company. They were only producing one to two products a year. And that seems insane, especially when you compare what Apple was doing at the time to like what an IBM or a Microsoft were doing at the time. Companies that were similar in size and scope, but had a massive number of products rolling out in any given year. And Apple only had one to two. Uh, and this is when Steve Jobs had come back, you know, after he'd been kicked out basically of his own company that he'd started and then he comes back and he re-engineers the whole uh, company basically based on the lessons that he learned at Next Computer and at uh, Pixar. The question is why, right? If you look at that time at the products that Apple was coming out with that were incredibly innovative, things like the iPhone, the iPod, things that sort of broke the expectation of what was possible for consumer technology at the time, it was completely different from the products that IBM and Microsoft were coming out with. And a big reason for that, I'm convinced, is the fact that Apple was super focused. They were focused on, all right, we've got these one, two really big goals that we're going to hit and everything else we're going to say no to. And that's something that at Slice Engineering we've tried to do. I'm not the best at it. Focus is always a struggle. But finding a way to narrow down, all right, these are our big things that we're going to do this year and everything else is something that's not as important and we're going to say no to. So if you look at our history over the last few years, you'll notice that that's basically the pattern. We come out with one to two products a year. So if we look at a sort of a timeline, if I could write a slice, we've come out with different products every year. This is the original Mosquito and our Magnum hot end. It's essentially a slightly higher flow version of the Mosquito. In 2019, we came out with our Vanadium nozzles, which is a abrasion resistant hardened 
steel nozzle. It was groundbreaking at the time, just like the Mosquito and the Magnum were groundbreaking in 2018. Uh, in 2021, we came out with, uh, a, or excuse me, in 2020, we came out with a Bridgemaster nozzle. Interestingly, uh, while we were working on Bridgemaster, what we were actually trying to develop is something that's going to come out over here. I'll talk about it in a minute. But uh, in 2021, we came out with the uh, Magnum Plus hot end, which broke a bunch of records for print speed or um, volumetric flow rate at the time. Everybody that was running a speed benchy for the speed benchy competitions in 2021 was using a Magnum Plus. That was pretty exciting. Uh, in 2022, we were supposed to come out with our Gamma Master nozzles. My handwriting is atrocious. It's going to be hard. But that ended up slipping all the way to 2023. And you can see, based on what I was talking about a little bit earlier around timelines, product development timelines, sometimes things just take forever to figure out how to do correctly. And so Gamma Master ended up being a 2023 release, and so was our Mosquito Prime hot end. And Mosquito Prime actually started back here with Magnum Plus. Magnum Plus and Prime were started at the same time, but just the level of difficulty of actually developing the product and releasing it in a way that met our expectations and was able to make a significant impact on the market it took us years to figure out how to do it correctly. So part of this whole thing is we are really committed to doing things with excellence and, and building products that have a significant level of quality to them in craftsmanship. There's a ton of testing that goes into it. Most of these sort of years in between are, it's all testing. You know, we come up with an initial concept, something on a whiteboard that we sketch out or dream up. And then that needs to be tested empirically using the scientific method. And we will build uh, what's called a DOE, a design of experiments. And the DOE is essentially, if you've got all of your test variables and, and test conditions, and you're gonna run different tests and different test conditions to see what the results are. You know, you might get uh, you know terrible results for this, but then you know good results here, and and then this one is is good results, and this one has bad. And it's like, okay, well, which variable should I be should I should I be changing? What can I do to adjust this test or to adjust the design in such a way that I get the outcome that I actually want at the end that is going to create the product that is actually creating value-added innovation and bringing that to the market. So design of experiments take time to build. They take time definitely to execute. I would say 80% of the product development is just testing, running different types of tests, developing the test over and over and over again, changing little variables here and there to try and optimize the design. Of course, there's research involved as well. We read a lot of papers. Uh, we're located near the University of Florida and work with a number of different university partners and collaborate with them on research to try and, again, push something that's bringing real value-added innovation in the market, which is one of our core values. All right, the other part of this is if we just wanted to produce a consumer product, it's probably a little bit less development time and less testing and QA that needs to go into it. But because we serve a consumer market and we also serve an industrial market, we need to make sure that the products that we come out with align with the requirements for both. So when we are coming up with a new design, we need to think about, okay, some of our customers are going to use this to print medical grade peak, a polyether ether ketone, which is a polymer that's used for high performance applications. And then some of our customers are printing PLA and they might be making toys or a fixture for their garage or something. And so there's a pretty significant difference in requirements, but because we're serving this peak printing market as well, we need to make sure that our products have the engineering specifications that are able to push that performance envelope while also accommodating this you know, more maker style uh, performance envelope. The other thing that we take into account here is going back to the engineering specifications, we're really focused on what is the long-term effect of the product that we're creating and how do we make sure that what we're creating today is still useful five years from now on being installed on an industrial machine 
as opposed to looking at, all right, what is the trend? What's what is trending on Twitter right now? What's trending on Discord? You know, what is kind of the latest thing that everybody's excited about? That's not what we want to look at. We want to look at, all right, what is something that is lasting that is going to provide a sustainable business model in a way that we can provide sustainable support to customers that have a 5, 10, 15 year time horizon as opposed to a, you know, just caring about the particular build that they're working on at this very moment. So that kind of future forward thinking, you know, what does it look like, not just in 2024, right now when we come out with some new products that I'm really excited about, we should have two product launches this year, going along with that trend I talked about of, of one to two products a year. But how is this in 2034? You know, what does the market look like? Obviously very hard to predict. 10 years from now, uh, it's hard to predict tomorrow, much less 10 years. But how do we develop products and build products that if somebody is still running them 10 years from now, is still providing a good level of performance and providing a good uh, user experience that isn't reliant on something that's going to fail quickly. So future-proofing, developing things that are designed with the long term in mind a machine tool is expected you know in the cnc industry is expected to last for 10,000 hours 5,000 hours uh, expected to last for many years 3d printing should be the same way that's where professional industrial machines are focused the industry in general is not there yet but that's the goal and that's what we're building towards is how do we build a product that is going to survive and work with your business for the next five, 10 years, 5,000, 10,000 hours. How do we achieve that type of reliability that you see in a CNC machine tool on a 3D printer? As an industry, again, we're not quite there yet, but that's what we're working towards. And we at Slice are certainly pushing the envelope on making sure that that happens and that trend is moving in the right direction. Another thing about product design that I didn't really touch on, but it's iterative. That testing, whoo, dropped my thing. Uh, that testing is that we talked about with the design of experiments. It's an iterative process. So you have a test, you get a result, and that just leads you back to another test. And you do this cycle over and over and over again. You know, maybe it's 10 times, maybe it's 100 times before you break out of that cycle and you say, okay, that most recent result actually leads me to a conclusion that informs the final product. And while you're going through this iterative process, you're optimizing the design, you're recording your findings, you are taking the learnings from that. And a lot of times those apply to future product development. So for example, I mentioned that Magnum Plus and Prime were developed, at least the concept developed basically at the same time. And so what we found was we were able to get Magnum Plus launched in 2021, but we still had to do more of this iterative testing for Prime that took an additional two years of changes to the design, changes to our test procedures, learning about materials, developing expertise internally and externally as well to come up with a product that we really felt comfortable releasing. And that iterative process, the learnings that we took from these two are helping to inform the future product design that we have right now for products that are in the pipeline at the moment. Some that are even gonna be released in 2024, plan to be released in 2024 and beyond. So excited about what's to come on our product development and the pipeline. I think you guys will be really excited to see it too. And the iterative nature of product development just can't be overstated. It's make an educated guess, test your hypothesis, get the result from that test, apply the results to the new hypothesis, iterate. And that does take time. But the time is well invested because it creates a better final product that we can be proud of, that you can be proud to own, and that you can run for years and that is worth investing into. Typically, but not always, you see a trend where 
as the volume increases, quality is going to go down, you know? And it might look something like that, where this is where you've got, you know, a handmade SIG. I have no idea if I'm spelling this correctly. And where, you know, you're buying a product. When you buy the product, you get the CEO's phone number and you can call him and say, hey, there's something wrong with my car and they will fly another one out to, for you. Right, that's that's crazy stuff. And then and then down here is like uh, you know Timu. If you guys watched the Super Bowl last night, saw the Timu ads. So really high volumes of stuff, not the highest quality product, right? Uh, but you know what you're getting into when you when you set up a Timu app and you buy something for 99 cents. So typically that's how that curve works. There's somewhere in here where you get an optimum value for the product. And we try to strike that balance. I'm sure there's plenty of commentary on one way or the other of whether we've struck the right balance or not. But that is our goal. Our goal is how do we strike value, right, for the end use customer that is printing flexible dragons on their Ender 3 and also for the medical device company that is gonna print something that's gonna be implanted into, into the human body. Both those are important because they have value for the person that's doing it, it's their creation. And we wanna encourage that creative process and be a catalyst for that creative process as much as possible while striking this balance of where are we on this value line, right? Of cost, quality, and volume. Thanks so much for watching. If you found this useful or informative, please like, subscribe, or comment down below. You can also find a link in the description for a form to fill out where you can send us topics that we can cover next. And of course, don't forget to stay zesty.